Okay, the recording is on. Welcome to BC 308, um, the class on uh, Revelation and Daniel, where we are studying the uh, the books of Revelation, uh, Daniel and Revelation, going through it very carefully, verse by verse, uh, on the, the prophetic scriptures. So may I ask somebody to please pray with us and get started? Thomas, would you please lead us in prayer? Then we will start. Uh, it's Pastor, I'll pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful day, Lord. We bless your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Thank you, Dad, for enjoying the new grace of you. Father, as we seek to learn your word, the spirit of wisdom rest upon us. Thank you, Father. Help us to understand and learn and equip for your kingdom, Father. We thank you. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you and welcome, everybody. So we started uh, with the book of Daniel last week. Um, we went through the, um, the first lecture was um, an introduction to the book, uh, to the course and also to the book of Daniel. And then we went through chapter two uh, of uh, the book of Daniel. So I'm just going to uh, quickly review a few things that we said last week, and then we are going to move forward. Now, um, like we mentioned last week, uh, we are going to focus on the prophetic passages or scriptures. Now, in the book of Daniel, we're not uh, reading the uh, historical um, or the incidents that happened uh, in Daniel, in the life of Daniel and his friends, the Jewish boys. Uh, we are leaving that out. Uh, those stories uh, most of us are familiar with um, and we're focusing directly on the visions the dreams that are prophetic in nature so we looked at chapter two where um, nebuchadnezzar the babylonian king had a dream and then he woke up he, he couldn't remember the dream he wanted his wise men to tell him the dream and the meaning and Daniel uh, was part of that. Those those wise men who had been uh, who were in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar. The Jewish boys had been trained uh, and to serve in the courts. So Daniel goes back. He prays with his friends. God reveals the dream and the meaning to Daniel. And Daniel comes and speaks to King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, and he tells him the dream. Uh, this is Daniel chapter 2, which we did last week. Just to re recap, uh, this uh, Nebuchadnezzar saw this big image, head of gold, uh, the, the, the breast and arms of silver, and then he saw the belly, the thighs of uh, brass, then feet of iron, and then he saw... Uh, the, the legs of iron and the, uh, the 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 feet was a mix of iron and clay. So the uh, legs of iron, when he comes down to the feet, it was a mix of iron and clay. So obviously, uh, it's not a perfect blend. It's it's a you know like a fragmented um, a mix um, uh, pieces of iron iron and clay. The ten toes. And then he saw a huge rock that was not not carved of uh, not taken out of by men's hands. This huge rock comes and crushes this entire image, everything, and uh, totally destroys this entire image. From the gold to the feet, everything is gone, and this rock becomes a huge mountain that covers the earth. And then Daniel interprets, gives the king the meaning. He says, uh, and I've shared the notes today, uh, chapter uh, 2, 5, and 7. Hopefully we'll, uh, we will cover chapter 5 and also chapter 7 today. So Daniel tells the king the meaning. He says, you know, this, this gold head represents you. Uh, uh, referring to the king Nebuchadnezzar and also to the Babylonian 
kingdom. Now, I'll be using the word kingdom and empire interchangeably. Uh, you know, we don't want to get too um, hard and fast on it. But it just means a domain where there was a leader, a king. So he says the head of gold represents you. But after you, there's going to come another kingdom. That's the silver, the, the breast of silver. And uh, then after that, there's going to be another kingdom, the bronze. And then after that, there's going to be a very strong kingdom that's going to overpower everything else. So he talked about the, the legs of iron, very strong. But then that would become the feet, which are a mix of iron and clay, meaning it's going to be fragmented, it's going to be uh, a loosely held kingdom. He also spoke that there would be a mix of, of the peoples. So that means a mixed race, a lot of different people. Um, and then there would be these ten toes. Right? So that was it. And then after that would be the kingdom of the Messiah. The God himself, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom on the earth. That would be the final kingdom. The God, uh, the God of heaven will set up his kingdom. So what we said was uh, that in this very first dream that, that that's recorded here in Daniel, it's like an outline of what is to come further in the book of Daniel. Right? We will get more details. So this is like yeah, you know, the outline, the opening uh, picture, which is going to be further developed. A lot of details are going to be given to us as we go through the book of Daniel. But what we noticed was it starts off with the present time. That means from the time Daniel was King Nebuchadnezzar. And it goes all the way till the eternal kingdom or the kingdom of the Messiah is set up on the earth. So what is the time frame being covered in that dream? All the way from the time of Nebuchadnezzar to till the kingdom of the Messiah. That's the time frame it's fully that's covering in that dream. But it doesn't tell us the duration of all the kingdoms. You know, it doesn't, it just says, okay, there's going to be one, there's going to be another, there's going to be another, there'll be the fifth kingdom, and then there will be the final kingdom of the Messiah. It doesn't tell us what is the duration or if there are any gaps in between. Uh, you know, it doesn't tell us that, but just uh, gives us the sequence. But the details are going to start coming in the subsequent chapters. So it's like an outline given to us. Okay, so we're going to go forward from there. Any questions? Maybe you might have thought about this or read chapter two. Anybody has any questions before we go forward? Okay, no questions. Feel free to ask or type it in the chat. All right, so now in Daniel chapter three, uh, we're not going to spend time in chapter three, but uh, it's just a quick overview. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, at that time, he's very powerful. He's the Babylonian king. So he makes this big image, uh, perhaps of his, his, his god or whatever he imagined of his god. Uh, he said, you know, I want everybody to worship this image. And we know the story. Uh, Daniel's three friends uh, refused to worship the image. And then they are thrown into the fiery furnace. But Nebuchadnezzar sees that there's the fourth man in the fiery furnace and uh, you know the, the, these three Jewish boys or Hebrew boys are not burned, they are unharmed. They come out and it, it makes Nebuchadnezzar so aware that the God of the Hebrews is the God overall, right? So that happens in chapter three. And then in chapter four, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has his own humiliating experience. He sees a dream uh, and a, a big tree that grows and then it is chopped, the tree is chopped. And then uh, uh, he sees, you know, uh, himself being tied with chains to, the, to the, uh, the stump of the tree. And uh, he's wondering what, what, what does all this mean? And so he brings Daniel and Daniel gives him the interpretation. He says, King, you are that tree. 
you're going to be chopped down. You're going to, you know, roam around like a madman you know, for seven times or for seven years. Uh, but then after that, you will be restored. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he loses his mind. That means he becomes uh, mentally uh, ill for a period of seven years uh, where he's treated, you know, he's, he, he's no longer the, the, the great king who was in, in power and control. Uh, he's a man who's lost his mind, mentally ill, uh, unable to do anything. Right? He, he roams around or, you know, uh, as though, as an animal, so, you know, so to speak. But then after the seven years, he is restored. I mean, he, he regains his mental capacities and he realizes that there is only one God, the God of heaven. And it humbles him. And once again, he acknowledges there is the God of heaven. So that's chapter four, but we're not seeing uh, uh, the prophetic or, you know, or the foretelling. It's more of an experience of Nebuchadnezzar himself that took place. So we're not paying attention to that too much. We now come to chapter five, right? So everyone's with me. Let's go to uh, Daniel chapter five. So when you come to Daniel chapter 5, uh, and you will see some of these things in the notes uh, that I've given you, the PDF, you can look at it. Uh, it starts of Daniel chapter 5, starts off with Belshazzar, the king. So we are now skipping some time in between. So, so Daniel was uh, serving, he actually served four different people. Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, uh, Darius, and Cyrus, I think, yeah. Um, uh, the four different kings or leaders he, he, he served. So um, So when you come into chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 1, the starting, it starts up with the name of Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar. So by this time, Nebuchadnezzar is dead. And uh, in between, there, have, there were uh, a couple of other leaders who came in for, for a brief period. They were killed or murdered and taken out of the way. And finally, Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, is in charge. And I've just given you that his, history piece there in the notes. I mean, it's not uh, something you have to memorize or learn, or learn. It's just for information. So basically, time has passed. And uh, now, you know, just keep in mind that historical dates and age, uh, these things are approximate. They're not precise because uh, history of those those times, we're talking about 6th century BC coming into the 5th uh, you know, century BC, the, those times. It has to be reconstructed uh, based on you know, documents that people find, archaeological information and all of that. So history is basically reconstructed based on all of those, those things. And so um, the dates that we put out or the age, these are approximate, but you know, it would be close enough. You know, so it's not going to be deviated by uh, hundreds of years or, or even 50 years, but, you know, it'd be close enough, maybe two to five years in that range, kind of, you know. So you'll find some variations from books to books or uh, a historian to historian in the actual dates, but they're approximate because that has to be reconstructed based on, you know, archaeological findings and writings and so on. So whatever dates I've put in the notes, just keep it in mind. It's, it's approximate. They're not always precise unless it's been stated. You know, if something happened on a particular day, then we can state this would happen on that day. But otherwise, they are approximate based on uh, uh, historical findings. So... Chapter 5, we have the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar who is in charge of the Babylonian Empire. 
and uh, he is, you know, making merry. He is living uh, an extravagant uh, life, and uh, um, I, I'll just skip. I mean, I'll just quickly mention the introduction, and we will actually read the prophetic part of it. But if you will, if you will follow along with me, in verse two of Daniel chapter five. You find that Belshazzar is uh, feasting and he's actually using the gold and silver vessels that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem. You know, just think about, uh, you know, how, how uh, humiliating it must have been for the Jewish people. The vessels, the gold and silver vessels that were being used in the temple in Jerusalem is being used by this king or this man, Belshazzar, uh, to feast in his palace or in his court. And so he has all these people, they're drinking and they're making merry and and that's what in verse 3 says. They brought the gold vessels that were taken from the temple of the house of God. And um, the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, they were drinking and they were making merry, right? At that time, at that time, verse 5, something very, very supernatural, very, very spectacular happens. And you don't find something like this uh, uh, elsewhere, I mean, something very similar like this. In the king's palace, in the king's court, wherever he was, a hand appears. It says in verse 5, In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. So just imagine it, it, what a shock it must have been. Here is Belshazzar, at that time, king or man in power. He's making merry. And there's a hand that comes and it writes on the wall of the palace. And the king sees the hand on what is written. It's, it's, uh, it's shocking. It would have been shocking to the king, right? And uh, immediately, uh, uh, you know, he, verse 6 says, he, he is shaken up uh, and uh, he's troubled. And uh, it says here, his knees knocked against each other. That's verse 6 of Daniel chapter 5. Right? So really, he's shaken up. He's shivering. He's afraid. What is this? There's something that completely disrupted all the merriment that was going on at that time. And so he calls for his, uh, verse 7, he calls for, uh, you know, his wise men, the people in his court. He tells them, can you, you know, uh, read the writing and give me the meaning. Now, what is this? This is a supernatural thing that's happened. What is, what is the writing and yeah, what is the meaning of it? Obviously, there's a message there. And then he promises, you know, I will... I will reward this person who was able to do it very well. And uh, the king's wise men, they could all, you know, they were looking at it. They couldn't, under, you know, uh, decipher it and decipher it and give its meaning. And then somebody remembers uh, that there is a man. I'm looking at verse 11, Daniel chapter 5, verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom. And the spirit of the holy God is in him. And he did, he was able to do amazing things in the time of Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Now, I just want to make mention here, the word father, don't let that, uh, 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 you know, misguide, because technically, this is his grandfather. But in Aramaic, there was no word for grandfather. So, just the word father or ancestor, your forefather is being used. But historically, you're talking about Belshazzar was a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. But anyway, somebody reminds him and he says, you know, there was this man, Daniel, 
and the spirit of the Holy God was in him and he helped your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, so call for him. And so the king sends for Daniel. That's verse 13 and 14. And he tells him in verse 14, Daniel, uh, I heard that the spirit of God is in the spirit of, the, of God is in you. You've got light and understanding and excellent wisdom. Can you read the writing and tell me what's the meaning? Right. And he says, you know, I will give you all this reward. I will put a chain around your neck and you'll be the third ruler uh, in my kingdom. I'm going to elevate you and so on. Now, so we're going to um, uh, pick up what Daniel uh, reads and explains to the king, right? So let's go to verse 24. So I'll just give you a little background so we know, you know what, is, what is happening. But the main prophetic word is from verse 24 to 31. Can somebody read it, please? Daniel chapter 5, uh, verse 24 to, to 31. Again, it's a very short passage. We will read it. Daniel 5, 24 to 31, please, somebody could read it. Go ahead. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is message that was written many, many tekel and per seen. This is what this verse means. Many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means waited. You have been weighted on the balance and have not measured up. Per Persean means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belsajar command, command, Daniel was dressed in purple robe, a gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belsajar, the Babylonian king, was killed, and Tyrus the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Okay. Thank you. So Daniel reads the, uh, the writing and he gives the interpretation. Now, uh, 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 now these are not uh, words of a language that was known to the people, right? Because if it was a language uh, known to the people at that time, for example, if it was in Aramaic, uh, any one of the wise men would have read it and understood what was said. So obviously these, what he read was an unknown script, was an unknown language. And what he interpreted therefore was not something Daniel did through his intellect. It wasn't like, okay, I know this language and this is what it means, right? But um, uh, to, for, Dan, for Daniel to, you know, to uh, read these words, the inscription, and to get the meaning and then the interpretation of what, what it actually, how it applied to Belshazzar was a supernatural work of God. It was God who does it, the work of God. But his interpretation, based the message simply meant King Belshazzar, you've been found lacking. And notice he said, your kingdom has been divided and it's given to the Medes and Persians. So through that, the writing, Daniel prophesied what was going to happen. Your kingdom 
is going to be given to the Medes and Persians. Your kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, was going to be given to the Medes and Persians. So now, when you go back to chapter 2, the image, the head of gold, the next part, that is the, 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 the chest, the two arms, now we can understand that represents the Medes and the Persians. The other ones are going to take over from the gold, the head of gold. And uh, symbolically, two hands, meaning there are, there are two groups of people, the Medes and the Persians. They're, they're closely, closely connected, but yet they are different. The Medes and Persians, they're working together. And they are going to take over from the Babylonians. Now, the very day, or the very, yeah, the very day that Daniel gave this message, that same day, King Cyrus, the Persian king, his army overthrew the Babylonian kingdom. That very day. Right? And uh, Belshazzar was killed. And literally, historically, there wasn't much of a fight. Uh, the whole, the king was killed. The whole kingdom was taken over by the Medes and Persians. They're working in tandem, working together. And King Cyrus appointed a man to rule and uh, his name, so Darius the Mead, Darius the Mead was uh, appointed uh, to be in charge. Now, historically, and this is just historical information that um, uh, uh, the, the, the other name for Darius, and this is in your notes uh, that I've shared, uh, of course, I've taken this historical information from one of the reference books um, that uh, the person who was appointed his uh, other other name was um, Gubaru, Gubaru, so uh, or Gobrayas, Gobrayas. So this was the man who is referred to here as Darius the Mean. So King Cyrus appointed. Darius, or this, his other name is Kubaru, uh, to be in place of Belshazzar and rule that part of the kingdom. Because, of course, the Persian Empire extended beyond that and it took over the, the Babylonian Empire. And he appointed this man. And sure enough, historically, uh, Kubaru, or Darius, as referred here, was 62 years old, uh, just as Daniel mentioned. Right? So here you see the transition from the head of gold to the chest of silver, where the Medes and the Persians have overtaken the previous empire. Right? And they have, and, and historically they've uh, identified the dates of when all of this happened in October 12th and 13th, 539 BC uh, was that night uh, when uh, Belshazzar was killed and uh, within about uh, 12, uh, sorry, and then, and then about 16 days or so on the 29th of October, uh, 539 BC, uh, Darius the Mede was put in charge and he, it now came under the Medes and the Persians. So historically, all of that information is there. But why is this part important? Because this explains to us the what we saw in chapter two, the transition from the gold head to the breast or chest and arms of silver, the Medes and the Persians. It explains that to us. And historically, it was fulfilled. It happened. In fact, it happened the very day Daniel gave the interpretation. Okay, then 
in chapter 6, which we will not spend time. So now, Daniel is serving under a different kingdom because now the Medes and Persians are taken over. So he was there from Nebuchadnezzar till Belshazzar. And then now the Medes and Persians are taken over and Daniel is serving under them. And that's chapter six. And this is when, you know, Darius, the king at that time, uh, uh, you know, he makes a decree that you shouldn't pray to anybody else except uh, 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 him or his God and uh, anybody else will be, if you pray anywhere else, anyone else will be thrown into the den of lions Daniel is thrown into the den of lions nothing happens to Daniel he comes out and then Darius acknowledges there's no God like the God of Daniel that's chapter 6 now we enter into chapter 7 so the first part of the book of Daniel chapters 1 to 6 has some amount of historical information from chapter 7 all the way through chapter 12 all these are prophetic texts it's it's all talking about things that are going to happen okay now what is interesting is these visions that Daniel that Daniel records for us from chapter 7 through 11 happened during his time from Nebuchadnezzar to Darius. Okay. So he's actually going back in time. It's like a flashback or he's going back in time and saying, okay, let me tell you the other visions I had between the time when I was, you know, when Daniel was in serving under the Babylonian Empire and then the Medes and the Persians. So he's recording for us the visions he had earlier. Okay, so that's why chapter 7 and verse 1 says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. So I'm, I'm now going to chapter 7. Is everybody with me so far? Okay, everybody's clear. Nobody's lost. Okay. So I'm starting off chapter 7, verse 1. And chapter 7, verse 1 is going back in time. He's going back to Belshazzar. So he's saying, look, when Belshazzar was alive, that time I had this vision. Okay. So that means... This vision that we are reading now in chapter 7 was something Daniel had even before Belshazzar was killed, right? So uh, in chapter 5, when we read about the handwriting, uh, that actually happened after Daniel's vision in chapter 7, okay? Because that was the last night Belshazzar was alive, okay? So now Daniel is going back and recording some of the visions he had, and he's sharing that with us, okay? So Daniel chapter 7, Verse one. Now, we have to be, we are going to go very slow from now on because every chapter, chapter 7, chapter 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 are prophetic chapters. And they have a lot, this is like the main part of the, of the book of Daniel, the prophetic text of the book of Daniel. Okay, so I kind of went through very fast the first six, six chapters because there, uh, chapter two, chapter four, and chapter five are some of the prophetic text, which were for, uh, chapter four and chapter five dealt with the kings who were there at that time. But chapter seven on is prophetic. We must pay attention. Okay, so. We're going to read verse by verse, okay? It's going to take time, but it's going to help us understand chapter 7, 8, and, and on, okay? So, um, it's a long chapter, Daniel, chapter 7, and I just, uh, maybe we could just read three verses each, uh, just so that everybody can participate. Daniel, chapter 7, verse 1 onwards, three verses each, and then maybe as we go along, I will interrupt and uh, 
I will make those comments to explain what we are reading. So could somebody read, please, three verses, Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. Somebody can start. In the year, in the first year that Belshazzar uh, was king of Babylonia, I had a dream and saw a vision in the night. I wrote the dream down, and this is to record of what I saw that night. Wind were blowing from all direction and the lashing the surface of the ocean. Four huge beasts came up out of the ocean, each one different from the other. Mm. Okay. So, Daniel is saying, uh, you know, I'm sharing the vision or the dream that I had in the first year of King Belshazzar. So that kind of gives us an idea of when it happened. So historically, they put it around 553 BC. Uh, so Daniel must have been around 70 years of age at this time. Okay, Historically, just making some rough calculations. So he says, I wrote the dream down. That's verse one. So that's an interest. That's a good thing for all of us. When we have dreams or visions, it's good for us to write it down. So Daniel said, I wrote it down. So that's how Daniel is able to tell us now uh, what he saw or the dream he had because he wrote the dream down. He recorded it. So the dream begins like this, right? He says, I saw four winds of heaven that were stirring up the great sea, right? So winds here, uh, we don't necessarily, we, we don't have a specific interpretation, but we can recognize that winds have force and these are uh, winds that are stirring up the sea. So obviously the pictures, these winds have great force. So we could just say that these are the forces of God or the, the forces that are acting on the great sea. Now, what is the great sea? Now, again, here itself, it doesn't tell us what the great sea is. But when you cross-reference prophetic scripture, and uh, uh, as an example, if you go to the book of Revelation, and we look at um, chapter 18, uh, I'll just point out, uh, give us an example here. Uh, Revelation chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 17, Revelation 17, we can look at verse 1. And then we will also look at verse 15, okay? Uh, so what we're doing is we're cross-referencing Revelation. We're going to read Revelation 17, verse 1 and 15. Can somebody read that for us, please? Revelation 17, verse 1 and verse 15. Then one, of, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Mm. So there's... We will be looking at this you know, later on when we come to the book of Revelation, but here we're saying a great harlot who is sitting on many waters. Verse 15, uh, what, what are these waters? Somebody could read verse 15. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitude, nations, and tongues. Okay. So what are the waters? The waters are peoples, multitudes, nations, towns. Okay, so this is prophetic imagery that is being explained for us itself. It is ex explained for us in the scripture itself. The waters represents peoples, multitudes, nations, our different races of people. So we take this over to our understanding of back to Daniel chapter 7 verse 2 the great sea waters so 
is most likely what is a picture or representing uh, nations, different races of people. So Daniel's saying, he's seeing the movement of the winds, that the forces of God or the forces are moving upon the nations. And out of the nations come, verse 3, come four great beasts that come out of the sea. Four beasts. So you're seeing four animal-like creatures coming out of the nations or races or different nations or different races of people. He's seeing these four beasts that are coming out. Everyone is with me so far? Any doubts, any questions? Okay, let's go on. Verse, uh, verses four, three verses, somebody could read it, please. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till it wings were bulked up and it was lifted up from the earth and made this made to stand on two feet like a man and i uh, and a man heard was given to it and suddenly another beast a second like a bear it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in it Months between its teeth, and they said thus to it, Arise, devil. Much flesh. Okay. All right. Much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a lamb, six, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The best also had four hats heads and communion was given to it. Okay. Thank you. So here Daniel is seeing and he's describing these animal-like creatures, these beasts that are coming out of the sea. First he says there's something like a lion. Then there was something like a bear. Of course, it, there are additional you know, aspects to it. I'm just skipping lion with wings. And there's a bear with that three uh, ribs in its teeth. And then there's a leopard uh, that has four wings and also has four heads. So that's interesting. Keep this in mind, a leopard, four wings, four heads. So some of this is brought up again, all right? So you're seeing these beasts. And then let's continue. Verse 7 uh, on, somebody else can read it. Okay. Verse 7 on. 7 verse 7, right? Yes. After this, I saw the saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong, exceeding, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it, has, it had ten horns. Okay, go on. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up along them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the root. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of men, and a mouth speaking great things. Hmm. Okay. Verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the ensign of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fair, fairy flame, 
and his wheels as burning fire. Okay. Okay. So um, that's still verse nine. Um, let's continue reading verse. Okay, so let me just make a few comments here. Then we go for a break and then we come back. So, uh, so he's describing these um, animal-like creatures. There was the lion with wings. There was a bear that was raised up on one side with uh, these ribs in its mouth. Then there was this leopard with four wings and four heads. And then there was another beast. So it was uh, just some sort of a creature. But this is verse seven. What is interesting is it had iron teeth. Iron teeth, right? So keep that in mind, iron teeth. Because we saw iron earlier, the legs of iron in the the, the image in chapter two, iron teeth. And it, it was trampling with its feet, right? It was different from all beasts and uh, it had 10 horns. So this image of the beast that he saw in verse seven, that, uh, that fourth beast had 10 horns. Then while he was looking at these 10 horns, he saw another little horn. So there were 10 horns, another little horn come. And it dislocated or it overpowered three of the previous 10, three of the previous 10 horns. It says three of the first horns were plucked out by by the roots. That means this little horn that came up on by itself overpowered three of those ten horns. Now suddenly, he says this little horn began to have some human-like expressions. It could see and it was speaking. It had a mouth. It was speaking pompous things, boastful things, proud things. And then suddenly everything shifts and he sees the ancient of days. He sees God. And I mentioned last week in the introduction that this ancient of days is a very beautiful and a very unique uh, term that we find in the book of Daniel referring to God, the ancient of days. He sees God. And he begins to describe him, you know, hair as pure wool and his throne like fire. He's seeing God sitting in power you know, and he's, 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 he's looking now at God himself. Okay, so we're going to pause here. We're going to come back. We will read through chapter 7. As, as we read further in chapter 7, Daniel gives us the meaning of these beasts that he sees and what actually happens. A lot more details are given to us, which is very interesting, okay? So let's take a break. Uh, we'll come back in about 10 minutes and we will start with verse number 10, okay? Thank you, everyone. 